some ways, Peter's image is asking you too much. It's not having a story with you at the movies. It's a story with you in your bedroom or in your living room. <laughs> I don't promise that. Um, so I'm going to be talking about The Crown, um, which is the one I had a family drama. In that sense, it's not so much unlike Downton Abbey. But it's a lot more than that. It's a family drama that's also a national history. And that's what I think makes it interesting and worth engaging. That is, it's a story of social and political change as seen through the eyes of a person and through an institution which is purportedly above politics and above these kind of changes, which exists by the grace of God, unchanging. So it's in some sense the relationship between these two that I want to talk about. We've seen three seasons of it so far, of a promise five. It goes from the marriage of, of um, then Princess Elizabeth to Philip, King of Edinburgh, 1947, through the Suez Crisis, the Profumo Affair, the two big minor strikes, the mine disaster, major events in British early 20th century history, and then ends with the Silver Jubilee. It's directed by one of Britain's best known and most honored directors, Stephen Daldry. Um, it's written by Peter Morgan, who wrote The Queen, which was a big movie in, 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 in 2006. Um, it's won, it's won uh, lots of awards. Um, it's a serious piece of filmmaking um, um, and of television. Now, Peter promised that a Greek historian would speak about historical inaccuracies, and I won't. <laughs> um, you can find those in Wikipedia. <laughs> but I don't think they're actually relevant for your enjoying of the series, and I don't think they're serious in, in terms of um, the historical issues that the, that the series uh, uh, engages. That is to say, it's a drama, and someone makes up conversation, and occasionally they make up a conversation that we know didn't happen, but it's pretty irrelevant. So nothing about inaccuracies. What I want to talk to you about is more of the kind of subject you would get in a history class, and it's still grown. I want to talk to you about two seemingly abstract ideas that I think structure this, this series. One is what you might call the political theory of British monarchy, or the, the constitutional standing of the monarchy. And the other is what I want to call the political theology of the crown. So let me do first the constitutional theory. Walter Badgett was um, <coughs> the founding editor of The Economist, wrote a famous account of monarchy in modern Britain. This is partly in response to Queen Victoria, a woman who had feelings and her own views, uh, which Badgett didn't share, and wished that she wouldn't share them either. Um, and in part, he thought, as ballast, what he thought were the dangers of democracy. So it's written in a very specific context of having a queen. What he argued, what he said, was that there are two parts of the British Constitution. One is what he called the dignified part. It was the House of Lords, um, and most importantly, the monarchy. And then there was the efficient part. That's the part that actually governs, and that's centered on the cabinet. I'm going to speak about the dignified part. The dignified part, he thought, the Queen in particular, the value of this, he said, is incalculable. The monarchy, he thought, needs to stand aloof and solitary, hidden in mystery, paraded like a pageant, a visible symbol of unity. So much of the, the, much of the drama that you'll be seeing in the clips I'll show you in a moment in this series is about a queen being hidden and solitary. She does not weep. She explicitly finds it hard to weep <coughs> when she's meant to, or some things you should weep at a national disaster. She's conditioned herself not to show emotions. She doesn't mourn, or at least not publicly. She doesn't at least, she doesn't even at least, in some ways sympathize with those she loves. For example, her sister Margaret's plight in having, not being able to marry the man she loves. Um, and and various other it. disasters that, 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 that befall her. <laughs> if you look politically, what the, what the, what Badger says the monarch has, the monarch <clears throat> has three rights under this unwritten British constitution. The right to be consulted, the right to encourage, and the right to mourn. Now these functions, to be consulted, to encourage, and to warn, provide the structure for the history that this series presents. That it's, it's, it's dramatic scaffolding. 
Prime Minister's seers come and they consult the Queen and they discuss the various matters of state and she advises them and she encourages them. She represents in the series then the sort of abiding weight of the polity, above and yet part of it. It's not unlike what a president sometimes does in a, in a parliamentary republic where you think of the, the German president von Weizsäcker is able to sort of make a moral claim about um, uh, about the surrender of Germany in, 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 as not a, not a surrender but, but a liberation in a way that an elected prime minister couldn't make. So she stands at a kind of moral distance from the efficient aspects of, of government. And the queen plays this role in this so far. But a president isn't a monarch. Anyway, the British president is, 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 is not just like the president of a monarch. And that's because what I want to call it the political theology of the monarchy, which is both the premise of the crown um, and something constantly questioned in this movie, in this series, and in our disenchanted world in which we presumably no longer believe in political theology. And as you'll see in the clip, I'm not being abstract and making this up. This is actually embedded in the series from the very beginning to the end. So what do I mean by political theology? I think many of you have heard the phrase, um, the king is dead, long live the king. What it means in the, in, in the series, of how this is represented in the crown, is as follows. So, in some sense, it's, it's the, the king in this, in this theology is like Christ. The king has two bodies. One is the body natural. It dies. In this series, we witness the death of Elizabeth's father, George VI, from a combination of lung cancer and coronary artery disease. We see it in quite explicit clinical, um, clinical detail. But we see as well the continued, continued life of the corporate body, the body politic, that's sort of coterminous with and represented by the mortal body, but, not, but different from it. So he dies and Elizabeth becomes queen. So the, the king is dead, long live, long live the king. Monarchy is then a sort of magic, and you'll see this explicitly in the thing I'm going to show you. It's a bit of medieval theology in some sense that it's outlived its time, and yet it's still potent. We can see today how this magic is done. That's what anthropology teaches us. But it's not just in our day. Shakespeare could see it. And Shakespeare could enact it at the end of Richard II. And that's, again, incorporated what I'm going to, what I'm going to show you. And from near the beginning of, this, of, this ser of the first series in The Crown um, to the end of the third, this theological holdover from another age frames um, the history of our age. So what I'm going to show you is four short clips. In the first clip, the Queen is, is um, discussing the coronation uh, with Winston Churchill, her first um, Prime Minister, played by John Lithgow, um, uh, who won a Film Actors Award with this, and, and Emmy, and, and, and other, in other words, he's terrific. And, and the discussion is, the Duke of Edinburgh wants to modernize the coronation. It feels the monarchy has to be modernized in any way, um, and Churchill feels differently, um, and it, it will be quite, it's quite, it's a quite controversial topic. And in fact, um, it is in some sense modernized. The coronation is shown on television. It's the first great political event shown on television. About a third of the population of this country watched highlights of it. Um, it was my first television experience. My parents were German immigrants, thought television was the work of the devil, so I saw it next door. Um, so it was a big, it was a big, um, it was a big uh, moment for me. So in any case, they're discussing what it should, what, um, whether and how it should be modernized. And it wasn't some way, and in some ways it wasn't. So, um, so that's the first clip. Let me show you that, and then we'll do the second one. And the changes he is proposing to an ancient, sacred, never previously changed liturgy and text. It, it, it went from top to toe. And if it were just a business, it would be applauded. But this isn't a business, it's the crown. Right. And one has to ask oneself, what is the purpose of the crown? What is the purpose of the monarchy? Does the crown bend to the will of the people to be audited and accountable? Or should it remain above temporal matters? 
Say you. No, ma'am. What say you? The decision is yours to make. We will take our lead from you. So, you see, I'm not making this up. <laughs> so, the second clip you're going to see, the second clip. So I'm framing this, which are you think that from the first series, the beginning of the first series, and we're going to end with the end of the, of the, of the third series. So this, this is now the reenactment of the, of the ceremony in which she's anointed with early oil, plus a, a bit of the actual footage. And then it's going to end with the Duke of Windsor, her uncle who abdicated um, uh, the throne, who simply had uncrowned himself, <coughs> remarking to an audience in Paris about this magic that is being enacted in London. Let's go back to this next one. Anointed, blessed, and consecrated queen of all the peoples, whom the Lord thy God hath given thee to rule and govern in the name of the Father and of the Son. Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, oh, and those orbs and scepters, symbol upon symbol. An unfathomable web of arcane mystery and liturgy, <coughs> blurring so many lines, no clergyman or historian or lawyer could ever untangle any of it. It's crazy. On the contrary, it's perfectly sane. Who wants transparency when you can have magic? Who wants prose when you can have poetry? Pull away the veil, and what are you left with? An ordinary young woman of modest ability and little imagination. Wrap her up like this, anoint her with oil, and hey presto, what do you have? undergrads and grads who remember this from reading Machiavelli. So it's a central feature, not in this, but in the whole aspect of understanding the, the nature of, of political power. So I'm going to end with two, with two uh, short ones. The following two show, in the third episode, um, the Queen and Prince Charles, and then Prince Charles alone. Charles has been sent off to Wales to learn some Welsh um, before he's been invested as, as Prince of Wales. And he's sent to a Republican Welsh nationalist, which creates all sorts of, who hates monarchy, thinks this whole thing is ridiculous, but takes on the job. And he actually ends up liking Charles, sort of, and he teaches him a bunch of Welsh. And Charles then gives a talk, gives his part of his, his speech at Carnarvon, the castle, where he's invested in Welsh. And the Queen then discovers that what he actually said is he's sympathetic with the plight of the Welsh, and he, was, he likes them, their, some of their, these aspects of their national version. And she's furious at him, and he says, well, can I have my views? And she says, no. <laughs> and then he's declaring himself to be a person, and then you'll see he imagines himself playing the role of Richard II in a Cambridge drama society. Now, he, he didn't actually play the role of Richard II, but he was reactive in the Cambridge drama society. But Richard II is was the great play in which this king's true body's theology is enacted by Shakespeare. So the, the, the series that sort of ends its, its third series with this idea of Charles puzzling about what it is to be both human and king and what it is to be unkinged. 
So we can see this next one. He's in the Queens. He's, his mother, he knows his mother's mad at him. He's cold in the bedroom. He says, can't you just congratulate him on doing well? And she says, no. He did bad. <laughs> okay. Family we are not entitled to do. Which is why we have to hide those feelings, keep them to ourselves. Because the less we do, the less we say or speak or agree or... Or breathe. Or feel or exist. The better. <laughs> <laughs> Doing that is perhaps not as easy for me as it is for you. Why? Because I have a beating heart. A character. A mind and a will of my own. I am not just a symbol. I can lead not just by wearing a uniform or by cutting a ribbon, but by showing people who I am. A voice. Let me let you into a secret. No one wants to hear it. <laughs> You're talking about the country. My own family. No one. The next episode, you're going to see him playing, starting Richard II in his head and see him playing him. And what you're going to see, given this historical license, is the way Charles imagines Richard so releasing his body politic from his corporeal body. That is to say, the mirror is broken. But within the hollow crown, rounds the mortal temples of the king, keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his palm, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize. Shakespeare, but <laughs> um, so um, the, as I say, the, the mirror he becomes body natural. With Richard becomes so. I recommend this series to you um, it, it, as an entry into the history of a transformative time in British history. But also, I want to suggest as a way of thinking about political legitimacy, about the attraction of the democracy, the dangers of populism the importance of ordinary efficiency and accountability on the one hand, um, and the power of charisma, or the need for something else above efficiency. Um, charisma was originally a gift from God. We don't live in that world so much anymore, but one sometimes wishes for something above efficiency. 
So the crowd is, is entertaining. It's sometimes superficial and sometimes silly. But what, what I suggest to you in this talk is that it's informed by questions that I think are of deep interest to historians and I think will be of interest to all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Our next speaker is Stephanie Jones Rogers. Um, Stephanie's research focuses upon gender and American slavery, but she also works on colonial and 19th century legal and economic history, especially as it pertains to women, systems of bondage, and the slave trade. Her first book, which was published last year, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, um, is a study that draws upon formerly enslaved people's testimony to dramatically reshape our current understanding of white women's economic relationships to slavery. This year, the Smithsonian Magazine named it as one of the top 10 history books of the year. Um, today, um, Stephanie. Tonight, Stephanie's going to talk about the film Harriet. First, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I know you have so much you can do with your Wednesday evening, so I'm very appreciative of the fact that you're here with us um, tonight and here to hear what I have to say about the film Harriet. So Harriet Tubman, the flesh and blood woman, certainly needs no introduction. Born Araminta Ross in 1822, she was the fifth of nine children born to Harriet Rick Green and Benjamin Ross. Tubman was an extraordinary woman who was enslaved, stole herself from her owner, and secured her freedom in Pennsylvania. Tubman was one of the most successful conductors of the Underground Railroad. In spite of the fact that she likely suffered a traumatic brain injury from an overseer's assault upon her when she was just a teenager, and an injury which caused her to have epileptic type fits and spontaneously fall asleep during her 13 dangerous and daring journeys to and from Maryland as she shepherded at least 70 enslaved people to freedom, some of whom were her, her immediate and extended family. Tubman's de detailed instructions also served to aid at least 70 other enslaved people to find their way north. As if those achievements weren't enough, Tubman later went back to the South during the Civil War, served as a Union spy, scout, nurse, and cook, and became the first woman to lead an armed assault on an enemy territory. She led the 2nd South Carolina Colored Regiment up the Combahee River to victory and helped liberate approximately 750 enslaved men, women, and children in the process. After the war, Tubman continued to advocate for the formerly enslaved, the elderly, and for women's suffrage. She died in 1913 in Auburn, New York, at the ripe old age of 90. As a historian of slavery, I think that the movie Harriet did considerable justice to many of these aspects of Tubman's life and accomplishments. I'm an avid moviegoer, and I do try to leave my historian's hat at the theater door. <laughs> I tend not to judge films on historical events or figures as harshly as some other historians do. If you're on social media, you know what I mean. <laughs> Films like this are, after all, meant to entertain us. But I also recognize that there's a degree, that there's a danger involved in crafting a film so loosely based on fact that the movie would only serve to misinform less knowledgeable viewers and further propagate antiquated and inaccurate interpretations of the past. Unfortunately, on several occasions, the movie Harriet ventured into this dangerous territory. And I think that a few are worthy of note. Throughout the, film, throughout the film, there were the usual embellishments, complete fabrications, and flourishes which the film's creators added simply for effect. But there were also disappointing and sometimes disturbing omissions or cursory treatments of important dimensions of Tubman's life and experiences in bondage. The film's creators crafted a Harriet Tubman whose story always seemed to be tied to men. She was either pushed or pulled by, into action by men, be they black or white. In the movie, Tubman supposedly fled Maryland because her master died and her master's son had decided to sell her. 
She purportedly changed her name from Araman to Ross to Harriet Tubman because of the abolitionist William Still suggestion and urging once she arrived in Pennsylvania. Her desire to reunite her with her first husband, John Tubman, allegedly compelled her to return south to find him and bring him north. Her freedom was made perpetually precarious, allegedly because of her deceased master's son and his endless quest to reclaim her and deliver her back to slavery. It was made even more tenuous, allegedly, by a black slave hunter named Bigger Long's pursuits of her. Um, this man allegedly aided her master's son in tracking her down. But in fact, we know very little about Jonathan Brodus, who was the alleged master's son, um, and also named Gideon Brodus in the film. So his depiction in the movie is fictitious. There was no real Bigger Long in Harriet Tubman's story either, or anyone else's for that matter although there were indeed some black men or, and women who aided in the tracking and re-enslavement of fugitives in the South and the North. The truth is that the actions of a white woman named Elidas Ann Broadus, Harriet Tubman's mistress and final owner, served as the catalyst for Tubman's initial flight and for several of her return missions to the family members and friends she left behind. When Edward Broadus died in 1849, Elizabeth inherited Harriet and her family. Harriet immediately understood the implications of her master's death because she had seen several of her family members and friends sold away prior to this. She knew that death often meant sale. She had already experienced the sale of several of her siblings, even loved ones, and she knew that her master's death was yet another time when, she, when sale would be imminent. And she was right. Shortly after Edward Browdis passed, Eliza, not her son Jonathan, immediately began to sell the slaves she inherited. Harriet saw the writing on the wall, and before Eliza had the chance to sell her, she stole away to freedom. Eliza wasn't prepared to lose Harriet's value, so she immediately placed an ad in the Cambridge Democrat offering a $100 reward for Harriet's capture and return. It's also worth noting that another woman, Mary Pattison Broaddus, uh, Edward Broaddus's mother, owned Harriet's family before Eliza did. Now, for reasons that I'm sure are obvious to many of you, the film's portrayal of Eliza Ann Browdis proved to be the most disconcerting to me. To be fair, the film didn't portray her as an angel or a silent abolitionist by any means. But her character in the film closely conformed to the plantation mistress archetype that we're all familiar with. She was mean, insulting, sometimes violent and indifferent to enslaved people's suffering. Yet when the film addresses the economic dimensions of slavery, Eliza becomes a marginal figure in Harriet's story. One of the worst aspects of the film's portrayal of Eliza, in my opinion, is the notion that Eliza needed a man to convince her to sell the slave she inherited from her husband. In the film, Eliza's son allegedly urged her to sell some slaves in order to pay her deceased husband's debts. This is a suggestion that the film um, alleges she immediately rejected. This, of course, is a figment of the filmmaker's imagination. Eliza's name appears on bills of sale for the enslaved people she was able to sell, and her name appears in the advertisements offering a $300 award for the capture and return of Harriet and her brothers. <coughs> Even when a man's name does appear on relevant documents, such as the runaway ad placed for when Harriet's uh, niece, Kaziah, dis disappeared, it's clear that the man is acting on Eliza's and not on his own behalf. This movie was indeed about Harriet Tubman, but it should have also been about Eliza Robbins. In the end, it was Eliza's decisions, it was her actions, which kept Harriet and her family enslaved. And it was some of those same decisions and actions that proved instrumental to Araminta Ross's transformation into Harriet Tubman, the Moses of her people. I am in no way implying that there would be no Harriet without Eliza, but I am suggesting that we must attend to the myriad ways that white slave-owning women like Eliza Ann Browdis invested deeply in the economy of slavery, result, re refused to dissolve those economic investments for the sake of black freedom, and more profoundly, how the refusals serve to further ferment and catalyze black resistance to the institution. The film Harriet left me with a few questions. Why, in an era marked by the publication of wonderfully rich and nuanced scholarship about the institution of American slavery, do filmmakers, even black filmmakers, continue to offer depictions of white women that distance them from the horrors and atrocities of slavery? 
Why do filmmakers fully or partially absolve white women from the darkest and most egregious sins of slavery, even in the face of copious evidence to the contrary, and even when white women's contemporaries readily acknowledge these women's profound economic investments in the institution? It's perplexing that films like this, which are undoubtedly based in part on the personal accounts of their subjects, ignore what enslaved people had to say about white women and their slave ownership time and again. Harriet, for example, along with two of her brothers, spoke about Eliza Robbins when they were interviewed by abolitionists, and they identified her as their owner when they fled. They also recounted her attempts to sell them. Similarly, Salomon Northup addressed the conduct of female slave owners in the community where he was enslaved for 12 years, yet they never appear in Steve McQueen's film about Northup's experience. I suppose Hollywood's tendency to distance white women from slavery in these ways has a bit to do with what some historians do. Um, they tend to do the same. In my own archival meanderings, I was astonished <coughs> to learn that white slave-owning girls or women were enmeshed in the freedom stories of some of the most famous enslaved people in our nation's history. Harriet Tubman's, Harriet Jacobs, and even Dred Scott's. Excluding white women from films about slavery like, ha slavery like Harriet, or absolving them when they do appear in them, does film goers and our nation a disservice. Audiences leave with a skewed and incomplete understanding of how the institution of slavery shaped the actions of everyone living in communities defined by it. It may go without saying to this audience, but this makes our work as historians even harder. And as I argue in the conclusion of my book, these characterizations of white slave-owning women leave us perplexed when trying to understand white women's racist conduct and white supremacist activities long after slavery ended. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. That was great. Um, our last speaker is David Henkin. David is a specialist on 19th century American history, <coughs> urban history, and cultural history. And he's the author, so far, of two books. One entitled City Reading, Written Words in Public Spaces in Antebellum, New York. Um, and one called Postal Age, The Emergence of Modern Communication in 19th Century America. David is currently finishing a new book on the history of the modern week. That's W-E-E-K week. <laughs> now, David today is going to be talking about the film Little Women. Okay. Um, my own, my own uh, mo on a movie date uh, um, is neither to leave my historian's hat at the door, uh, nor to point out in that awkward moment when the credits are rolling and you're looking to see if your companion enjoyed it, uh, not to point out the chronological anomalies or the, uh, the mistakes in set design, but rather to, uh, to muster whatever um, historical education I have uh, for the cause of uh, appreciating the specificity of the moment that we live in, for opening up a kind of gap between the present and the past where, where it exists. Uh, and that certainly was my reaction in seeing, uh, seeing this film. Uh, Greta Gerwig's um, Oscar-nominated 2019 film adaptation of uh, Lisa May Alcott's 1868 novel Little Women uh, has been held for all kinds of things. Uh, that are interesting. Uh, the one that has interested me most as I look through the reviews and the, really the, uh, uh, the adulations that have been heaped upon it uh, is for its sexual politics. Uh, lots of uh, reviewers, especially in middle and highbrow publications, uh, have seized upon this theme uh, and I would characterize it as follows. I would say that uh, Greta Gerwig's film is credited for uh, retrieving or capturing or even recovering uh, a kind of uh, a core feminism of the original novel, uh, and even uh, a kind of queer feminism of the original novel that is uh, uh, of, of interest to, to many moviegoers and perhaps might seem to account for its resonance 
for its resonance today. Uh, uh, there is, of course, a lot of focus in that sexual politics on the question of marriage, and uh, so I thought since one of the things I like to do at this university periodically is to teach about the history of uh, family and marriage in the 19th century, is I would offer some observations uh, on what I think that actually says about the time period in which we live, and I'm calling this talk, uh, Greta Gerwig's Little Women, the, the Case for Straight Marriage. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, the question of marriage in, uh, in Little Women and Greta Gerwig's Little Women, of course, is anticipated fully uh, by the novel itself, uh, uh, and especially by the decision uh, in the novel of, uh, uh, by, by the novelist to have the central character, the presumably autobiographical character of Joe March, uh, um, uh, married off at the end. This was a decision that quite infamously the author, Louisa May Alcott, disparaged, though I would not say regretted. Uh, responding to reader and readerly enthusiasm uh, for the first volume, uh, and what well, let's say we could characterize as commercial pressures conveyed by the publisher, uh, Alcott decided to marry off Joe, uh, despite the fact that famously Alcott herself was unmarried, uh, and uh, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very powerful, I think, image of, of a nautical image of, of, of marriage that the novel repeats several times that the movie abandons, uh, she announced I'd rather be a free spinster and paddle my own canoe. Uh, you see where so some of the, uh, uh, the current sexual political readings are, are, are going. So um, the question is, uh, what did Greta Gerwig do with this problem, with the problem of, 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 of the marriage of Joe and the relationship between uh, the, the marriage of, of Joe at the end to a uh, seemingly stodgy German professor who goes off to teach at an unnamed unnamed Western University in 1868. <laughs> so what does, what does Little Women do with that? One thing uh, the movie Little Women uh, uh, does uh, is to focus quite forcefully on the economic character of the institution of marriage. Uh, this is something that's far more explicit in the movie uh, than in the novel, and I'm going to focus on things that I think Gerwig quite deliberately, self-consciously chose to highlight or augment uh, the text with. Uh, so, uh, at various points, characters like Amy March insist marriage is an economic proposition, and it seems uh, in some ways like a, a bold feminist statement. This is, of course, a understanding of marriage that would have come as news to approximately zero people uh, in, in, in 19th century America, but that uh, was somewhat at odds with the uh, understanding of marriage that, that um, Alcott's father in particular, but that many of the people in Alcott's world were, were, were promoting and disparaging. Uh, uh, beyond the proposition that marriage is uh, economic, uh, there is also the, the more uh, problematic uh, understanding of marriage, marrying well as a mercenary <coughs> enterprise, which is here articulated by the character of, of Aunt March, uh, who is played <laughs> remarkably or characteristically by Beryl, Meryl Streep. Uh, Aunt March uh, uh, is, of course, instructing her, uh, her nieces, and particularly Jo, in the, in, in, in the scene, uh, that she needs to think about her future, and that means marrying, and that means marrying rich. So the only way to be an unmarried woman is to be rich, yes. But there are precious few ways for women to make money, and she says that's not true. You could run a cat house or go on the stage. Practically the same thing. Other than that, you're right. Precious few ways for women. That's why you should. I mean, this, this is one of those things that's really added to to the novel. I, I don't bother looking. There's no mention of cat houses. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in addition, the the, the, the stage uh, is uh, is not at all disparaged in. In, in, in the novel, nor in the in the movie. In fact, the stage is, of course, a site of special expression, camaraderie among among the sisters. As any of you who have seen any of the adaptations or read the book will will uh, understand. But there's kind of a hard-headed uh, understanding uh, that uh, uh, marriage, against the backdrop of economic constraint, is uh, a rational uh, thing for a self-possessed woman uh, to do. Uh, the alternative is kind of 
it's kind of powerlessness, vulnerability, or some sort of sexual ex 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 exposure. But what I want to say about this is that what the movie does especially well uh, is uh, pursue the implication of that equation by flipping it, which is to say, not to see, uh, simply see that marriage is an economic activity that must be sort of calculated against other economic activities, but that certain kinds of economic activities in turn resemble marriage. And the particular economic activity, the particular economic relationship that the movie far more explicitly than the novel thematizes that between an author and a publisher. Uh, um, this is a historically accurate one in terms of Alcott's biography to see her, as this picture I think well captures, engaged in uh, some kind of collaborative conjugal economic relationship with a publisher, <laughs> with whom she's presumably not, not, not in fact uh, conjugally in, 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 in involved. Uh, but the novel doesn't speak about publishers at all. The movie, far from ignoring that subject, uh, actually uses it to organize the action of the film. The movie begins and ends uh, at a, uh, a publisher's desk where author and, uh, and publisher are negotiating. And there's kind of, there is sort of kind of uh, conjugal banter between them, but it also is an economic negotiation. Uh, so I, the film does well is to, is to, is to call attention uh, to the relationship between marriage and other kinds of economic exchange by offering us this paradigm of a certain kind of economic relationship. Uh, the second thing uh, that the movie does with marriage is to introduce uh, elements of desire that are, are pretty much stripped uh, from, from the novel's undertone. Not to, to, to suggest that, that, that marriage, even if it's economic, must be fueled by desire. The absence of desire for, that Joe Marsh has for, for her expected partner, uh, uh, Teddy Lawrence, in, 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 in the novel, and in the novel, her uh, 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 Joe's ultimate marriage to uh, uh, an explicitly unattractive, stodgy professor uh, is transformed here in a number of ways, not least by the casting. Uh, uh, the uh, incongruously, but I think uh, quite strategically, uh, gallicization of the character. Uh, uh, the guy is still called Friedrich Baer and is still supposed to be German. Uh, but there's no attempt to, uh, to have Louis, Louis Gabriel speak in anything other than like a comically French accent. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and in fact, it is through this character that we're meant to understand uh, that, um, uh, that Joe's writing is related to desire and her future marriage uh, to Professor Bear uh, is somehow uh, energized by desire. When they first meet, uh, he points out that she's a writer and she says, oh, I'm just doing this for money. And he says, uh, she says you know, uh, money is the, my one and only aim in my mercenary life. And he says, no one has ink stains like that out of desire just for money. Right? Uh, again, these lines that have no counterpart in, in, in the novel are meant to call our attention uh, to the role of, 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 of desire as some kind of necessary condition for the ultimate uh, decision, uh, which again, the author Alcott disparaged. She's like, I'll show them. I'll have. I'll marry her off to someone like obviously unappealing, uh, um, and then separate them by a continent uh, to desexualize their their, their relationship. Uh, Greta Gerwig is, is not is not is not doing that. The other thing that she has, in addition to desire, uh, is the notion of loneliness. Uh, an important plot point that the movie introduces is absent in the novel is Joe Marsh's uh, regret of her rejection of the marriage proposal from Teddy and her writing a letter, a letter that is posted but ultimately does not reach its intended recipient, it's the intercepted or purloined uh, letter of this movie, where she, uh, she says, no, I am in love with you and I do want to get married. And the explanation for it comes in her own mouth, but I'm so lonely. Right. She never says that in the novel. Now, loneliness is an issue in the novel. It's uh, projected onto her by, by Marmy, her, her mother, and it's, it's played with, the word's played with by, by the narrator. Uh, but Joe never actually says in the novel that, that she's lonely, but it's important, it's important to, uh, uh, to Gerwig's sense of, uh, of, 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 of the plot decision to, to, to have her marry, that be driven by, not just desire, by loneliness. Um, 
And uh, this, of course, is, uh, I think, a, a clue uh, as to why this is the 2019 version of Little Women and not, and not one of its predecessors. The idea of loneliness as central to marriage uh, uh, is, uh, uh, I think, a major uh, theme and a discursive figure of our own time. Uh, I'll read you some about it. Marriage responds to the universal fear that a lonely person might call out only to find no one there. It offers the hope of companionship and understanding and assurance that while both still live, there will be someone to care for the other. This is not from the novel. It's also not from Greta Gerwig's movie. Do we know who's saying this? Justice Kennedy. 2015, the Obergefell decision, the Supreme Court rules uh, that the reason why uh, states are obligated uh, to license and, and honor and regulate same-sex marriages is because marriage is uniquely s suitable, uniquely appropriate, uniquely capable of relieving a, uh, a, a condition uh, that every person has a right to have relieved, and that is the condition of loneliness. Greta Gerwig's uh, 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 putting into Joe's mouth uh, uh, the crucial uh, self-diagnosis of, of lonely is the explanation, in some sense, for why, why, she, why she must get married. Uh, uh, when Greta Gerwig knows full well, the decision to marry her off is far more complicated, uh, um, and that uh, Alcott only did it in the novel. Oops. Uh, Alcott only did it in, 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 in the novel out of commercial pressure. Uh, so, how does she get away with this? How does Greta Gerwig uh, get away with, uh, with uh, presenting uh, what she wants to present, uh, which is marriage as an emotionally nurturing, indispensable institution, uh, on behalf of a novelist uh, who seemed to feel quite the contrary, who seemed to feel that, that uh, um, the proper thing for a woman to do is to paddle her own canoe. And I, I think here the, an the answer, or the crucial key, lies in the fact, uh, or what I would call the major innovation of this film. And that seemingly is small, but winds up having huge consequences, which is that uh, uh, Greta Gerwig inserts the, um, the uh, production, the publication of Little Women into the story of Little Women. It's something you may not be so taken with or even struck by uh, when you see it, but it's pretty significant that although Jo March is a writer in the novel, she's not actually writing Little Women. Uh, but in all kinds of explicit ways, Greta Gerwig makes it clear uh, that Joe Mark is writing Little Women. And so there's a, a sort of mise en abeam where, where this, the story you are seeing uh, uh, is really embedded kind of confusingly inside, uh, 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 inside, the, inside of itself. Uh, so at the very end, when, when Joe does seem to marry uh, the, the handsome... <laughs> Young German professor, the French accent. Uh, uh, yeah, you actually are left wondering whether she really does, because there's a simultaneous uh, uh, marital collaboration between author and publisher, where the author says, "Sure, I'll marry her off in return for copyright," and they go back and forth. And then you see, uh, almost sort of parodically, like a romantic comedy, uh, uh, the scene where Joe March runs after. It ought to be an airport. Uh, runs after Professor Bear on the train and the umbrella, right? Uh, uh, and you're wondering whether, are you supposed to believe that this actually happened in the fictional movie you're watching, or are you supposed to believe only that it happened within the fictional publication that she's producing? And that, that indeterminacy, I think, in some ways allows Gerwig to have it both ways, both to pay homage uh, to modern marriage in, 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 in its, uh, um, you know, uh, judicially sanctioned glory, but also to, uh, to uh, bond with uh, the feminist author who uh, refused marriage at the time. Thanks.